Good morning to you today. Glad that you could be here this morning with us. <clears throat> so glad to have another day to worship the Lord. Amen. Amen. Today I want to look at Luke 1, and we're going to read quite a few verses of Scripture. Luke 1, 5 through 22. So there's quite a bit of reading for our text today. This is the story of the birth of John the Baptist and the miracle that took place in order to, to make that happen. Uh, so it involves a lot of reading this morning. So if you've got your, your word with you, let's turn to Luke 1. And look at, we'll start at verse 5 today for our reading. Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 5. And this is what the Word says out of Luke chapter 1, starting with verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And there were both righteous before the Lord. They were both righteous before the Lord, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren. And they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife, Elizabeth, shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. And he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not be able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. I want to talk about, for a few minutes, the results of being faithful. The results of being faithful. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, for the opportunity to share the word of the living God today. We thank you, Lord, for those that have attended our parking lot service and those that are tuning in live stream. 
and will be listening to the podcast later. God, we pray that just by us opening our heart to your word and attending and worshiping you, we, Lord God, know we'll receive blessing from you. We know we'll receive, Lord God, the touch of the Lord and his blessings upon our life because we have opened our heart to believe and we receive your word. God, because it's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, we receive the power of your word. We receive, Lord God, the blessing of your word and your presence today. Lord, let the Holy Spirit do his magnificent, mighty work in the hearts of every person that receives your word by faith today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The results of being faithful, when you read this story, you, you, you're reading about two very faithful people. The Bible tells us a few things about Zacharias. Zacharias was, of course, fulfilling the old covenant responsibility as a priest. And his lot fell in the course of Abiah. When David was king, he broke the priesthood up into responsibilities, called them courses or divisions. There were, I think, 24 of them. One of them was called Abiah. And they tell us that after the, the, the release uh, uh, the, of the Jews from bondage, not all of the priests came back to serve in the temple. But they went ahead and they divided, I think, the four courses that they had back into 24, and they spread the responsibility out among those 24 courses again as, as David had assigned. So they, that means that they were, were less people to share the responsibility of the ministry of, of the house of God. When David was king, there was a lot of people, a lot of priests. It was... Not a hard time to serve the Lord. But when Israel fell to their enemies and were carried out off into bondage, and God raised up Cyrus to release them, and they came back, few came back with Ezra, few came back with Zechariah, uh, with, uh, the, uh, with, with Nehemiah and others that led them. Zerubbabel was the governor. He was a Jewish governor that was appointed over the building of the setting the foundation and the operation of building the temple you find out that when they came back there were fewer to share the responsibilities of the task of worship so now they had they had, they had 24 sections but it was spread out among fewer people because it was a di difficult responsibility and times were hard during those times so so many of the priests would not come back and take their responsibility. They stayed. It was just easier to, they were, Israel had been in, uh, Judah had been in bondage for 70 years, and after 70 years, they got a custom of living in a strange land. So they just carried on life there instead of fulfilling their assignment and coming back when God let them go. So now, the the number at that time were, were fewer. So they divided it back up into 24, I believe, courses. And we find that in the days of Jesus, a man named Zacharias was of the course of Abiah. So his descendants were fulfilling their priestly duties. They were helping with the tasks of worship. Aren't you glad, church, that you've got people that will take on the responsibility of providing worship and doing the chores and the work that it takes to have worship today. It, you, know, you know, I know a lot of people, they just drive up and presto, it's done, but, but that's, not, that's not the way it happens. And uh, I've got, you know, I've got lay people in the parking lot, and I've got pastors and pastors' wives in the parking lot. I want you to know, these pastors and these pastors' wives, they know exactly what it takes to get ready for a service, especially if you're a small country church. And, you know, a lot of things are being done by you. You know, you're having to take care of it. Well, that's the way they felt. There was a lot of responsibility being done by a few to have service. But aren't you glad 
there are the faithful few. There are still, out of all the population of the world, there are some faithful people that will say, look, what can I do to help? What can I do to make this happen? And pastors understand the value of people who sacrifice their time. I mean, they could be home spending time eating breakfast this morning with their family. But I've, I've got several people in here singing, lifting up praises to God, play, using their abilities. They didn't have to do that. They're all volunteers. I've got two, two wonderful men who left their breakfast tables and came this morning and set all this equipment up. And I tell you, we've got some faithful people in the house of God. The devil don't have everybody. And these are young people. And, you know, I'm 58, so the young people, uh, they're older. The group is older now than it was when I was 35. When I was 35, young people were basically in their 20s and, and, and teenagers. But now I'm 58, young people can be anybody younger than me. Anybody younger than me. They say that when Paul wrote to uh, Timotheus, Timotheus, when he said, you know, don't, don't let anyone despise your youth, some commentators say he was 50, in his 50s when he wrote that. So to the old man Paul, you know, and we had John on the Isle of Patmos, he was an old man in his 80s. So, you know, these 50-year-olds were young to those 80-year-olds and those, those old guys that that thought 50 was young. You know, don't feel real young. But these are young people. Now, we got one older guy. I appreciate Brother Sidney. <laughs> he, but you know what? He, he, he moves around like he's young. You know why? Because, he's, first of all, he's got Jesus in his heart. Second of all, he loves to serve the Lord. And I thank God for, for the old dude, Sidney. <laughs> Brother Sidney, I know you're not much older than me. You're just a few months older than me, but I'm going to pick on you a little bit. Thank them for coming. Thank those people for using their gifts and talents. So we understand that the work of the ministry involves people that have been anointed. They're not necessarily called to pastor or preach revivals, but they, they, they use their abilities to serve the Lord. And so we look at this story and we see Zacharias served the Lord. The Bible says that he and his wife were well stricken in years, so they had done it over and over and over again for a long, long period of time. Now, I want to I tell you something. I have the utmost respect of people that are stricken with years and have been in the work of the ministry for way longer than I have. And, you know, I, I, I won't even go into how long I've been doing it, but I was raised in a minister's house, so I feel like I've been in it all my life. I was a preacher's kid. But I look and I see how people are serving the Lord. I see, I see people in their 80s working in the church, serving the Lord. I go by some churches in the community, and they're out there straightening up. I'm talking about senior adults working out in the, in the cemetery, working out in the yards of the churches, cleaning up. I see them coming out of the churches with garbage bags in their hand, volunteering their services to keep the, the house of God tidy. I, I, I know pastors that have not retired that are serving the Lord well up into their 80s. You know, and they're serving the Lord in their little community. Been there a long time doing it every week, doing their responsibility, showing up for the good work of the kingdom of God. And, and I give honor to all of these people who have been in this thing a long, long time. Lay people, ministers, singers, workers, doing something for the glory of God for a long, long time. I think it's time for us to lift up the faithful, the people that are there right by the side of ministers who are called into this for a lifetime. And shoulder to shoulder, the laity and the ministry 
as the army of the Lord serving God in the house of the Lord and in ministry of every kind. And so I applaud you, and I, and I lift you up and honor you. The Bible says give honor where honor is due. And I believe there are some churches that wouldn't even be in the community if it hadn't been for people doing what they're still doing today as long as they've been doing. People come, people go. I've talked to some people that new churches have sprung up. They're worried because their church is, is, is seemingly few and far between, and I know we're in a pandemic, and people get afraid, and, and they no longer come and support it. And new churches really suffer because you don't have that many core people that's been doing it long enough to be strong enough to stand in there with you and to keep doing uh, what needs to be done to keep think outside the box. Get some people to come alongside of you. Do it differently, but still do it. Amen. And so they're worried that their new ministry and their new work might collapse because you got all the finances and you got all the responsibilities. But when you're doing a new work, there's not that core group that's been there a long time, that faithful, and that they're, they've raised their children to be faithful, and their kids are helping you out. You don't have that in a new work. So I'm praying for these new works. We need new works. We need new ministries. We don't have enough churches in this God-forsaken world that we live in. We don't have enough gospel being preached. As much as we have, it's still not enough to combat the forces of darkness in this last day evil work of hell that we see coming on the face of the earth. So I'm praying for struggling ministries, especially those new plants, new works. I'm praying for them to make it and for them to find some people like Zechariah and, and like Elizabeth that they can lean on. Like Moses, he, he leaned on a man on the right hand that came up and held his hand up. Her, I believe it was, and, and I believe it was Joshua. And they come up beside him, and they held his hands up. We need some people that, that, that hold our hands up in ministry, and it takes faithfulness. So thank God for the faithful. The Bible says, he that is a steward, you know, a faithful, let him be a faithful steward. He that is a, a bishop must be faithful in all things. And so faithfulness is a is a, an important thing. And we look at these two people in the story, and there was much faithfulness that they had, they had um, manifested for many years. The Bible says they walked uh, before the Lord in all the commandments and the ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they were both righteous. In the New Testament, the Bible said, that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him as righteous. So what are we talking about? We're talking about two believers here. We're talking about, according to the scripture, they believed God. And they kept his word. And they walked in the commandments of the Lord. I want to tell you, that's something to be said today. People that still believe in the word of God as it is spoken in the word. Not rewritten. Not watered down. Not changed. Not, not telling another story, but every, every oracle, the Bible says, rightly dividing the word of truth. Thank God there are people that understand that and are still walking faithfully in the inerrant, infallible, forever and ever word of God that shall never pass away. Can anybody give God praise for people that still believe in the word of God? Hallelujah. There is a departing from the faith in a lot of places. They're departing from the truth. They don't want to hear truth. They won't tolerate truth. The truth is the Word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't want to hear it. They won't tolerate it. But I want to tell you, these two were faithful to the Word of God, and they believed the Lord. And they were, they were called and assigned to do certain things, and they were faithful to their assignment. The Bible tells us, the Bible tells us that he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. So here's a test. If you're not going to be faithful in a little bit, God knows that we shouldn't give more to 
to a person that's not faithful in a little bit. You know, some people say, well, that's not enough for me to even give my time to. Well, that's not the way the kingdom of God works. Promotion comes after you have shown faithfulness to where you are now. And if you're faithful in a few things, he'll make us ruler over many. And Jesus said, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. Now, we look at Zechariah. He had been serving the Lord and being faithful all these years, doing the same thing. Whatever his lot fell that week, he, that they say that these people had a whole week of responsibility when it was their turn. They were on a rotation when it was their turn. And whatever they had to do, it, the Bible says his lot fell on lighting the incense. Do you know the incense was in the holy place? And the Bible says, the Old Testament has that, the altar of incense right in front of the veil. Some New Testament scriptures actually have it on the inside of the veil. But the Old Testament has it on the, out, the outside of the veil. So he was, the only one that could go through the veil was the high priest once a year. And he had to be qualified. And he went to offer up once a year for the sins of the people. And but so Zechariah was in a very high position. So that shows me he probably didn't start there. He probably didn't begin there. But over the years, they said, you know, Zechariah, he can be trusted. He he shows up for the little details. He shows up for the little duty, the little assignment, the assignment that nobody sees and nobody recognizes. And eventually, he was promoted to leading the congregation in prayer as he went into the holy place. This, he would come through the outer court. He would go in the door. The Bible says, straight is the gate, narrow is the way. If you, in Moses' uh, tabernacle, when the outer court was built, you come through the outer court, you had to walk across the tribe of praise the tribe of Judah, you have to walk across. That's why he said, come into my house with praise and thanksgiving into your heart. He says, you know, come before my presence with praise. You'd walk across the tribe. You'd come in the outer door. And if you stopped and you looked from that outer door as you came in to the outer court, you could look straight in. If, if the curtain was removed and the doors were removed, you could have looked straight in to the mercy seat from that first door. So that's why Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Can't take detours to get into the holies of holies. you got to go straight. And the Bible says that Jesus' body was the veil, the veil of his flesh. So you had to go through Jesus to get into the very presence of God. That's why I said, no man comes to the Father but by me. And so you have all of these analogies about Jesus in the Old Testament. And so this man had come through the first gate, walked through by the brazen altar. He had come through the great laven, the great rather laver. The laver uh, represents sanctification. They would wash up. And it was like a mirror. They would take a mirror or they would look into the looking glass or the, the water and they would see there and they would make sure everything was right and then they would go in. And they would walk in there and where, where Zechariah was, there was the table of showbread, the word of the living God. There was the lampstand, the Holy Spirit representing the anointing of Jesus. And he walked on in towards the veil. And right in front of the veil in Moses' tabernacle, there was a place called, there was another altar, not the brazen altar, but the altar of incense. This is where he approached, and that's where they offered up incense and prayers. And the people, the Bible says, were on the outside praying. He was leading them in prayer. They were interceding. And he was lighting the incense for prayer, leading the whole people. And so over the years, the, his responsibility and the trust of this man he had won the trust of those over him, and now he was assigned to something very important, and that was to light those incense. And he had done different things, I'm sure, over the course of years, over and over and over again, and never seen an angel, never had an outpouring of the power of God, never saw uh, the glory of God uh, 
himself doing what he was doing, but he still did it. He just kept on doing it. There wasn't anything spectacular maybe. All these years he, he had done it. No special feeling when he, he was probably tired when he got through with his chores serving the Lord like we all get. But on this day, this old faithful man had been faithful all of these years. I get excited when I think about it. his faithfulness put him right where he was supposed to be doing right what he was supposed to be doing when God sent a message to that, mo- that holy place because he, he was faithful to God in his assignment. And he showed up, and the Bible said, in the normal arrangement of his course. This, this actually means there were, they didn't have to wait on him. They didn't have to reschedule it because he was late or he, he couldn't make plans in his, in his, in his uh, uh, personal life to be there. It was his turn, and like he had done all of these years, he had set personal interest aside because it was time to go to the house of the Lord. It was time to show up for Jesus. And when he showed up on that day, here he was an old man. He had shown up for many years. He had done little things. Now he was doing big things. But I want to tell you, being faithful to God, I'll put you right where you're supposed to be, right when you're supposed to be there. Just think about it. If he had gotten faint, the Bible says, don't be weary in well-doing, for you shall reap in due season if we faint not. That's exactly what he was talking. He was looking at people like Zechariah. Just think about it, Zechariah. You know, I've been doing this for so long, and you know, I think I'll just take a day off today. Oh, no, not him. He said, no, it's too important. The people need to pray, and I need to lead them in prayer, and we need a touch of God, and I feel like we're, we're actually walking around in the very, very last days of our era, and something new is about to come out of heaven and I don't want to miss it so I'm going and I'm going to be faithful to my calling and when he did an angel showed up on that day named Gabriel wow you got to be kidding me an angel never happened before I want to tell you something if you'll keep serving God eventually things will happen that's never happened before in your life heaven will visit you why did heaven visit him? Well, him and his wife had been praying. The Bible said they couldn't have children. They were barren. They had no descendants. I'm sure by this time, this point, he had probably not really thought that it was ever going to happen. He had given up on the idea. I'm kind of sure of it. I'm kind of, you know, he had kind of just said, forget it. It's not going to happen. We're too old now. Isn't that something when you're faithful to God? Things that you think that's done, the season is over. It can't happen anymore. I might as well move on with my life and give up on those promises that I've been believing God for that hadn't happened. But he kept showing up and he was believing God for a promise years ago that had now been forgotten. And the Bible says, God has heard your prayer. God has heard your prayer. And I've come here in this house, where did God show up? In the house of God. Don't tell me the house of God is not a place of miracles. When people are faithful, miracles will happen. How many believe that this morning? Let's give God a praise. So I'm just encouraging somebody to just keep believing God and hold on to the Word of God. He said, after all these years, You've already got to the place to where that you thought God's forgotten about all those prayers about that baby. I'm here to tell you, you're going to have a baby. And I'm going to tell you, his name's going to be John. (laughs) And that new season that you've been believing God for, this baby is going to usher it in with his ministry. Oh, hallelujah. I believe God is going to usher in a new season for his church. Just keep being faithful. Keep showing up. That will put you right where you need to be in your life. Right where you need to be, when you need to be there. At the point you need to be there. He had reached that point where heaven touched the place that he had come to with his life.
because he had been faithful for many, many years. I'm believing that there are people out in the church world today that have been around a long time They've probably done give up on some things that they believed God that they were going to see. I'm telling you, don't give up on them. Like Zechariah, he had given up on it because when the angel told him it was going to happen, he didn't believe it. And I'm not going to cover that now. Maybe I can cover it in the next service. But, but he, he didn't believe that particularly. He believed God, but he didn't believe that thing that God said he was going to do because he thought it was too late. God, you waited too late. You should have come... You know, 20 years ago. You should have come 30 years ago. Look, let me tell you. God may not be there when you think he ought to be there. But let me tell you, he's always on time because he's on his time. He may seem late to you, but he's not late for God. God has got an appointed time. He told Habakkuk. He said, though it tarry, that vision that I showed you, he said, wait for it. For it's for an appointed time. There's some things God is waiting for us to get to a place. He's, he's waiting for us to get somewhere. He's, he's wanting to bring us to a place. But the things that He has shown us in His Word, the promise for this time and day in His Word, it's going to happen on His time, on His calendar. All I've got to be is where I need to be <laughs> for it to happen to me. I just need to be there. You know, there's a lot of people that are giving up on God, giving up on miracles, giving up on the work of God in their life. And I'm afraid they're going to not be right where they need to be because they won't persevere through the tough stuff, through the dry seasons. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Through the desert places, through the places of trial and trouble and tribulation where you have to just endure it and hold on to God like Zechariah did. But he kept pushing forward and being faithful and showing up for God until he was right where he was supposed to be when he was supposed to be there to receive the news from heaven that God was still going to use him in a supernatural way. A supernatural way, not just the natural he was faithful in the natural things. Now God was going to do something that was beyond him, that made people marvel. There was people, when she got pregnant and had John, began to rejoice and praise the Lord because of what they saw God do in this old man and this old woman who thought everything was pretty much over and they were about to give up all hope. Or maybe they had given up all hope that they would ever have this, this child that they had been praying for. But God heard them, and he to, he, they didn't know he heard them until he told them he heard them. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you before the angel has to show up. Let me tell you before the Holy Ghost has to speak to you. Let me tell you before anybody else has to tell you, God hears and answers prayer. He still does. And you'll receive the confirmation. God will give it to you. Because God is still a mighty, superhuman, supernatural, miracle-working God. Amen. Can you shout amen with your horn right now? Hallelujah. It's been good this morning. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. I want to speak the blessings of the Lord over you now. Would you just stretch your hand this way? I love the blessings of God. I want the blessings on me. I want people speaking blessings over me. And here's what the Lord says over his people. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. And everybody honked a great big amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for being faithful to the Lord. Being where you were supposed to be today. God bless you. Thank you for all that you do to help us. Thank you for your prayers, your attendance, your work, your giving. God bless you for all that you do in the name of the Lord. You're dismissed.